I was 10 years old when Halo 3 released, and though I missed out on playing the game during its initial launch, I wasn't unaware of its impact nor its significance in both pop culture and video game culture. It wasn't until I was 12 or 13 when I was finally able to get my hands on an Xbox 360, ending a painfully long three-year hiatus and subsequently drowning myself in a brand new world that I was already becoming addicted to but had never fully experienced. Halo 3 set the stage for what I expected and demanded out of video games for the foreseeable future, and its lasting impressions on my adolescent brain usually take first crack at the old limbic system whenever a new Halo game is announced. By the time Halo Reach and Halo 4 had been slated for release, I was old enough to experience the gambit of emotions that came from such monumental events, from reading about each game months before its release in magazines like Game Informer, to speculating with friends at the lunch table during school. I was even one of those weird kids typing into YouTube Halo Reach gameplay leaks, and from pre-release to post-cycle, the atmosphere of Halo season is something that can be manufactured, no doubt, but it's due to the organically seeded and nourished reputation of the series that always keeps fans coming back for more. All you have to do is tease a new Halo logo and let the gaming world take it from there. Within the past decade, Halo titles have been fighting to reclaim the glory they once held unanimously in the industry. Things inevitably turned from optimistic to disappointing, not you reach you were quite beloved even with your stupid bloom, as it always felt that the sequel Halo 3 deserved was never in the cards for development. Bungie had departed following Reach's climax, and in came 343 with a new studio, a new direction, and a new vision for the once revered sci-fi action shooter. This meant it was time to let parts of Halo's past die with the outgoing studio, even if it required flat-out killing some of the series' most recognizable characteristics. This is not to say that Halo 4 and 5 were complete disappointments. Halo 4's campaign took a jarring, albeit exciting, risk with its protagonists, and brought a refreshing level of depth and innovation into an otherwise stagnant character. Character narrative. All of this whilst exploring the Master Chief's inability to connect with a sense of self-humanity, and coupling his emotional fragility with the only human part of him struggling to maintain her identity. Cortana was fighting against the slow descent into a maddening malfunction, and thus Halo 4 became a character study into two of gaming's most iconic heroes. Halo 5 then took all of these narrative beats and threw them into a lake. <laughs> But I don't just play Halo for the story, I play Halo for its addictive and polished sandbox multiplayer. Unfortunately, these past two titles in the series have had some of the least engaging multiplayer yet, thanks to issues such as map design, weapon balancing, base movement mechanics, confusing customization, sound design, game flow, rec packs, microtransactions, map design, level design, didn't feel like Halo, map design, missing intangibles, map design, and finally, map design. While this series still remains my all-time favorite, beating out the likes of Call of Duty and even Pokemon, I had long feared that its best days were behind it and nothing would ever recapture the moments of a 12-year-old kid sitting in front of his Xbox 360, losing himself into the wonder of the Halo 3 universe. That is, until I played Halo Infinite. Which one? The skewer. Like it's, oh yeah. It's literally just a party gun. No! Damn it, Prude! <laughs> the you second time. Fast, there you go. Soften them up for you. Is that your third triple kill? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I had two overkill. Uh, two overkills that I almost got.
Maybe it's just been a long time coming, or the anticipation of a return to Halo's roots that ended up clouding my UNSC tinted glasses, but the first impressions of any game is where you make or break a player's commitment to it, and nothing could have prepared me more than opening Halo Infinite's menu for the first time. Remember earlier when I talked about intangibles? It's a massive part of what makes Halo feel like Halo, and within the first 10 seconds, 343 clearly understood the assignment. The intangibles are all of the non-measurable variables that make something what it is. For example, Halo 3 starts with a nostalgic ode to the studio behind it, then leads into the most recognizable title screen of any video game in the past three decades. The music, the text on screen, the placement of visual aids and graphic designs, the sound of the menu, the feeling of being tunnel visioned inside your television, the atmosphere and the undeniable resonance of starting your adventure just on the opening page. This is what intangibles are all about. Not even addressing the aesthetic layout of multiplayer lobbies or the time capsule-esque nostalgia of every coded sequence like choosing your desired mode of play or the starting screen of your first match. All of these small micro stimulants are what make Halo not just a game, but an experience, and when Infinite loaded onto its main menu, 343 did what they wouldn't do in Halos 4 and 5. They reminded us what Halo sounds like. Red music. We are music in it. So good. She yeah, had music's really good as well. I enjoy this game. What can I say? As first impressions go, this was an excellent start. The soundtrack is a wonderful mix of the classic Halo themes from CE to Reach, as well as a refreshing take on the space opera modernizations that the past two games introduced. Thundering drums and punchy angelic horns, mixed in with the rich choir-like vocal samples that the series has become known for. It's everything you'd want in a Halo soundtrack. And as far as first impressions for the atmosphere of the game, yeah, this feels like Halo. Like what Halo should feel like. But okay. This is just a demo. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. A tech preview. The weight of your heresy will stay your feet, and you shall be left behind. And there isn't much to break down outside of the gameplay itself. So let's talk about the actual gameplay. Well, you know what? I'm glad you asked. Let's go through the things I really liked about this preview, and let's go through the things I hoped get worked on for release. I don't want to say things I disliked because that has a very absolute feeling to it, as if there's no room for change. Whereas all the things I hope get worked on are just some of my personal constructive criticisms and observations as a beta tester. This is in hopes that there will be some room for improvement before launch, but all in all, my overall feelings on Halo Infinite so far are very, very positive. Let's change things up and start with what worked for Infinite, starting with the movement. This was far and away the number one worry for all Halo fans going into the new game, as the quite literally decade-old debate on Halo movement has continued even until today's video. Old Halo fans like myself swear by the smooth walking speeds of Halo CE to 3, while newer heads demand more freedom and increased pacing that keeps up with the games of this current generation. What I feel Halo Infinite does so well is it reintroduces sprinting into the movement system, but without making it a necessary component of playing the game. There are a ton of videos on YouTube going deep into the actual math behind the frames per second comparisons on both walking and running speeds, but in Infinite, the running speed is less than 10% faster at gaining momentum compared to walking normally. This balance in Infinite only works because the base movement speed of your Spartan is at a quicker trajectory compared to Halo 4 and 5, so you always feel like you have an option between the two movement styles, with many organic moments in-game heavily favoring walking over running. Couple this with the fact that Halo 5 made running such a necessary part of the equation to where maps had to be completely designed around the mechanic, Whereas in Infinite, the subdued manner of sprint and the speed at which the game naturally operates creates a balanced sandbox where movement is no longer forced onto the player. 343 have masterfully catered to both sides of the Halo fanbase by making sprint a choice and not a requirement. The movement of the game feels fluid and fast-paced like what we've come to expect, while different gunfights require different skills to traverse the map. Whether you're running or walking, everyone is on an even playing field, and that concoction of styles is what makes Infinite stand out from its predecessors. You get the floatiness of Halo 3's gravity with the freedom of Halo 5's pacing, all of which brings in a rich and deeply rewarding experience to the player. 
Hell, with how the base movement speed is, you don't even really need sprint in this game. But that's just me being an old head, and I'm honestly perfectly happy with both mechanics this time around, which is a sentence I never thought I'd say. The sound design of Halo Infinite is also some of the best in the series. From the wonderful instrumentals and soundtracks in the beginning of the lobby, to the thundering crack of the sniper rifle, which sounds like a nuclear bomb going off. No scope. Each UNSC weapon has a distinct and recognizable punch that only Halo can deliver. The Covenant weaponry continues on the Halo 5 trend of sci-fi audio signatures, with all weapons sounding futuristic and mechanically sound, no pun intended, but there was a bit to be desired, and I'll get to that point in a moment. Overall, I really appreciated the effort 343 put into the audio profiles for this game, as Halo deserves nothing less than perfection. And so far, so good. What Halo 4 and 5 struggled with was weapon balancing, and some weapons were too weak to be viable, while others required outliers like tracking rounds or extreme bullet magnetism to keep up with the advanced movement of the player. Because of the game's design, weapons had to be implemented to counter the movement, which immediately set them up to fail as part of a sandbox. This led to uncomfortable and often boring gunfights where a massive element of the core Halo experience was lost. In Halo, some guns are clearly better than others, but all guns can and should be viable. It's what makes the sandbox experience the best in gaming. And I'm happy to report that so far in Infinite, everything I got to playtest with had value, and all of the guns were exciting to both use and learn about during the game. The starting AR had slight bloom, but not enough to ruin mid-range gunfights, and that's a good thing. Hell, I even tore up lobbies using only the AR. It's kind of crazy, right? The pistol made for tightrope exchanges between each team's precision purists, and bloom wasn't much of a factor. Instead, it was about bullet spread, and that's another good thing. The BR is meaty and powerful, like it was in Halo 2, already making it probably the best gun in the game, and the plasma pistol might be in its most unstoppable form to date, which is another good thing. The power weapons are powerful, starting weapons are viable, and everything in between is solely up to how the player wishes to implement its capabilities into his or her own style. You can tell the developers agonized over making every weapon both fun to play with and worth picking up on the map, and for that, I tip my hat to 343 yet again. This is a core fundamental of Halo's replayability, and I think they've nailed it. Map design can make or break any game, but in Halo, the maps almost always transcend the game itself and become iconic pieces of gaming culture. Maps carry a lot of emotional weight with the fans, and while Halo has been home to some of gaming's most memorable designs in its past 20-year history, Halo 4 and 5 kind of dropped the oddball and relied too heavily on Forge presets. The maps were bland, uninteresting, kind of forgettable, and didn't make the game feel like Halo. There was a missing sandbox element, no interactive engagement, no reason to constantly replay the same maps a billion times with friends. But luckily, Infinite's three test maps were all a return to form and incredibly fun to play. The designs felt organic, natural, complementary to the movement of the player, yet just creatively varied enough to provide additional aesthetic challenges that would take time to master. The map Live Fire felt like a map pulled right out of Halo Reach, with its distinct three lanes and claustrophobic corridors. Recharge was an ode to Halo 4 and 5, with the industrial power plant providing a great balance between aerial combat and large-scale ground fights in the many open halls between the spawn points, a design you might see in something like Doom. And Bizarre felt like a throwback to Halo 2 on the grounds of Mombasa, with hints of Call of Duty and CSGO vantage points scattered between the various empty passageways. All three of these maps played extremely well, extremely polished, and were refreshing to the eye as the natural environments and organic structure in the map design seemed to be returning to the franchise. I do hope that for Infinite's future, we continue to see more innovative maps, as well as some returning favorites like Narrows, Guardian, Construct, Valhalla, and even The Pit. I also hope the design team tries to implement more interactivity into the maps, as it's one of the most important selling points for the Halo multiplayer. On maps like Sand Trap and Last Resort, being able to interact with the environment and large structures built into the landscape led to so many great moments, and coming back for more was almost guaranteed because of those features. Still, I enjoyed the small taste of what's to come, and I think Infinite is on the right path. 
Equipment has finally made its return to the franchise, and all I have to say is thank you! I have no idea why it took so long, but using equipment in Halo 3 was some of the best gameplay features we've ever had, and every piece of equipment could be used offensively and defensively, it just depended on how you deployed it. In Infinite, we got a taste of the grapple hook, which is far and away the best innovation 343 has made so far, and the drop wall acts like a secondary cousin to the bubble shield. I will say I found the drop wall to be relatively boring and practically useless in gunfights, and would much rather just swap out the drop wall for the original bubble shield from Halo 3, as it's a classic piece of equipment that was much more effective in combat. But if we keep the drop wall, then please at least just make it a little bit stronger or quicker to deploy because it came a hassle to use sometimes. All in all, there were only two pieces of equipment available for testing, and I absolutely can't wait to see what else they have coming. Power-ups are also back in a new and improved way, and this was a change I was most skeptical about going into the flight. Part of Halo's appeal as a first-person shooter is fighting over power weapons and power-ups on the field, and being a good player requires knowing when to pick up power-ups and when to fight over them on respawn. In Infinite, you can now manually pick up things like overshield and active camo instead of burning them on contact. I was initially worried about this feature, but after playing a few hours and testing it out, I have to say I really enjoyed having the option of choice. It felt like getting a wild card or a specialist in Call of Duty where you could save the home run swing for just the right moment and choose when to deal out the most damage or go undercover and sneak around the map. This added level of strategy played out really nicely on the three test maps and made for some crazy gunfights around potential power-up spots. It's a new layer of strategy for Halo that I think will turn out to be a welcomed addition to the franchise, and giving players the ability to choose when they want to use something is another positive for the sandbox. The second to last thing I want to highlight for the positives of the preview was the armor customization. Already, this feels like an extension of what Halo Reach gave us, and it ups the ante by giving you full control over what the look of your Spartan will be. From helmets, to visors, to chest plates and knee guards, to shoulder pads and wrist accessories, to even prosthetic limbs, Halo Infinite is sparing no expense when it comes to letting you decide how you look with your Spartan. The designs of the armor feel unique, individualistic, well-crafted, artistically rich, and they just look like Halo. Halo 4 and 5 really struggled with the idea of design for design's sake, and the armor went from Halo-esque to a random space RPG that doesn't even look like it belongs under the same game's title. Everything became a homogenous mess with no distinct flavor or aesthetic intent, but Infinite fixes all of these issues. When I keep saying that this game feels like a true successor to Halo 3 and Halo Reach, I'm not mincing my words. The armor takes the aesthetic design of the Halo universe from Halo 3 and the freedom of choice from Halo Reach and creates a wonderful amalgamation of the two. This is the best that Halo armor has looked since Reach, and I could not be more thrilled to report that back to you all. Finally, the tech preview gave us a few days to test out the game and get a feel for what's to come. And like how all first impressions are important, this small preview was no different. I don't know how to describe it, but Halo Infinite really felt like Halo, and not just a game set in the Halo universe. From the movement, to the gunplay, to the slow moments on the map, to the graphics and sound design and art style and pure raw feel of the combat, Everything I experienced in Infinite felt like I was playing a love letter to the Halo universe. 343 wasn't lying when they said Infinite was supposed to be a legacy game, and I'm happy to say it certainly comes across that way. This game is bursting with nostalgia and personality, a mix that only Halo can replicate, and it's doing it right. The game feels great, and I'm eager to learn more about the improvements and changes made before launch later this year. Now comes the most important part of the discussion, and probably the part where I make or break a lot of Halo fans' retention rate on this video, because for all of the good things Infinite teased us with, it also had its missteps that need to be addressed. Again, these are not things that are game-breaking, but rather parts of the game I feel would benefit from a second look. A lot of Halo's ability to entice new players is its atmosphere and polish as a game as well as the little things that add to the overall experience. Now, 343 has come out and said that this build of the game is a few months old, and a lot of the bugs and small details have already been updated since, and that is very good to hear. But this revelation won't keep me from pointing out what I felt was in need of improvement, so let's start with the most glaring change I noticed right off the start, the medals. If Halo multiplayer is remembered for anything specific, I bet you many gamers would point to the incredible metal system in multiplayer. The iconic symbols that jump out at you for pulling off cool moves or crazy killing sprees, as well as national treasure Jeff Seitzer's iconic voice that turns Halo's arena chaos into a real gaming experience. Ugh. 
The metals in Halo Infinite are incredibly small on screen, so small that oftentimes I only realized what metal I was on because Jeff was audibly telling me, rather than seeing the fruits of my labor flash on the screen. In past Halo titles, the medals were displayed north of the kill feed with vibrant colors and designs, easily alerting the player of their accomplishments. This time though, the medals were minimized to be a passing note in the middle of the screen, crammed next to the points you've earned for the various interactions. Not only does the kill feed need to be moved down to the lower left, above the player's radar, but the medals need to be bigger, brighter, more vibrant, and follow the same designs as the older games. Halo Reach took the medal system and introduced a plethora of new and exciting rewards, while also updating the looks of each trophy to stand out more individually. I've noticed some of the medals in Infinite seem to use the same color palette as others, eliminating the uniqueness and prestige of getting something rare. Why is everything red with white stars? Where is the iconic yellow circle with blue stars for a double kill? Why are medals like Kiltacular and Kiltrocity all the same color? This just doesn't make any sense, and it's a small change that has massive implications against the feel of the game. I hope 343 has already begun fixing this artistic decision, because if nothing else, Halo medals are a reward to the gameplay that other shooters don't offer, and getting rid of them just seems counterintuitive. This next critique will also have a very polarizing stance, but if you've made it this far into the video, I think you'd see by now how much I just love Halo, and I wouldn't bring it up if I didn't feel it wasn't necessary. The auto-aim on controller is essentially non-existent, and I think that needs to be tuned up massively. I was playing the tech preview on PC using an Xbox One scuff, and there was very minimal, if any, aim assist during gunfights. Now, I don't know if this is different for console players, and playing against keyboard and mouse players already leaves me at a disadvantage, but I asked friends who were lobbied up with me, both of whom are Halo veterans themselves, if they noticed anything different, and they also agreed. Auto-aim on controller is lacking. I think the newest Halos have gone more towards a bullet magnetism approach to naturally raise the skill gap over the years, but at medium to long range, some gunfights were almost impossible to stay involved with because I couldn't get shots to land. Hit registration is a whole other issue, and that seemed to be fairly consistent for the demo, but us controller players need some aim assist if we're choosing to use our thumbs over our arms. Let me know if you felt the same during your playthrough, because I definitely felt its absence, and hopefully this will also get tweaked before launch. This next note is more of a personal request, but one of the reasons I was turned off from recent Halos is because the Covenant gun sounds were a little too mechanical and lacking in personality for my taste. This couldn't be more evident than with the Needler. The Needler is my favorite gun in all of Halo, and in Halo 4 and 5, it sounded like a broken UNSC t-shirt cannon. And in Infinite, it seems they've kept the same sound profile for the weapon, and this is kind of disappointing. For a legendary gun with such robust sound and visual designs for nearly 20 years, why change what works so well? I'd really like to see 343 go back and fix the sound of the weapon, as firing it didn't give me the same nostalgic punch it used to. The new additions of the custom AI for each Spartan are a fun change and an interesting concept to help immerse new players, but if possible, I'd like the option to turn them off. Having to hear 30 different voices tell me things I already know or things I can just learn by playing the game was becoming a bit annoying, and while some people may love the additional communication, I wasn't immediately sold. Look, all I'm saying is if we have to use them, then can I at least get a Sergeant Johnson or 343 Guilty Spark AI to tell me all the obvious shit that's happening on screen? Poor Brick, he flew pretty good. Take a picture, it lasts longer. I'll even pay for those options, but giving the player a choice to not use personal AI would be a big bonus. The skewer is one of the more exciting weapons in Infinite, and it's about as straightforward as it sounds. It skewers shit with a big spear. This will be great for taking out vehicles and knocking them off course, but against Spartan soldiers, it just seems to be a one-hit kill, which, don't get me wrong, it's completely fine, but I was just hoping it played a little bit more into the physics of the game and allowed you to impale people into objects. Just imagine how fucking cool it would be to skewer somebody running away or moving along a wall, and the spear impales them into the surface they were headed towards. Talk about a must-have weapon off the start of the game, and the creative ways people can use that mechanic to form new scenarios on the battlefield, 
it's things like this that I hope we get more of as the full game releases. We got a small taste for the beta, but creativity with weapon designs will be a huge factor in Infinite's replayability. Whew, that was a long list. But the takeaway I hope we share from this video is that Infinite is in a really, really good place. While sure, there are small to medium-sized things worth noting that I'd like to see get addressed, nothing I mentioned distracted from the gameplay of Halo Infinite itself, nor the feeling of the game during my playthrough. Halo Infinite is not only up and running, but it feels polished, like care and attention to detail had been put into making it a true legacy Halo title. The only constructive criticism I had for it was just that, constructive, not game-breaking calls for help. I truly believe if the devs and 343 addressed some of my minor nitpicks, Halo Infinite would become an even more polished and well-rounded Halo experience for all fans. It's the little things, both the intangibles and the details, that make Halo what it is. And I want nothing more than for Infinite to be the very best Halo game we have ever had. Knowing that 343 is listening to the community and actively working to address the issues, concerns, and fix the game to suit the fans is one of the most rewarding feelings you can have as a fan of this IP. It shows that they're committed to making a Halo game that everyone can love, from the old fans like me, to the newer fans who just joined the community. There may be a lot I want updated, but there's so much about the game that I already love, and that is what I choose to focus on. If you enjoyed this video, maybe leave a like, think about subscribing, and let me know in the comments what you liked about the Halo Infinite tech preview. The road to 10k subscribers continues, so thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Ba bam